All right, so on this stuff, as I was saying there, Q is VA, so Q is the flow rate in cubic feet per second, and then uh, V is the velocity, and A is the area. Just watch your units when you're doing this, that stuff, right? So you just want to be sure that all the units match. And then, you know, you can rearrange that algebraically and solve it for velocity if you'd like. You can also um, do these types of problems here where you realize that the flow in is the flow out of a closed system like that. And then you can use that to figure out velocities exiting a pipe system, stuff like that, okay. So we're good with that. All right. Um, let's see. You just turned in uh, chapter three, right? Or what? It's actually it's chapter something else. It's just nine, eight, eight, one, one, eight, one, one, eight. So uh, maybe we ought to have like a test kind of thing on that. On that. Uh, so how about a week from today? Is that all right? I'll get you a review. Um, get you a review on that tomorrow or Wednesday, okay? So, all right. So that's coming up. So that'll be a week from today. Anybody got a staple? Yes. Staple. <laughs> you have a staple. All right, so uh, that that test on Monday, that'll cover up through that chapter eight that you just turned in. So I'll get that back to you on Wednesday. Okay, so you have it over the weekend. All right, now that's what you call fluid statics. It's called fluid statics because there's, the water isn't flowing. So this chapter here is actually, I don't know, fluid dynamics or something. I'm not quite sure, I guess you can call it that, but that is considering flow. So let's look at the next step down the line when water starts to move. Because when things start to move, it, things get a little different. Okay, so uh, what we look at when things start to move is the energy in the water. So let's say we've got some uh, piezometers, like we call them, sticking in a tank like that. You know, and how high is that water going to come up in those tubes? If, if we've got our original water level right here, and then we've got a couple little uh, tubes with elbows in them and no flow, you know, coming up out of that tank, how high is the water going to come up, do you suppose? Same, same height, maybe? Okay, yeah. And I don't know, the thing I used to say to us was water seeks its own level. I don't know if they still say that or not. Maybe they don't. Um, let's kind of look at that and see what's happening there. Okay, so the water will come up to the same height it is in the tank. That's the idea. All right, I'm on page 93 is where I'm at. All right. Now, if we really want to analyze this, what we could look at would be something like this. Let's say we got a closed valve. All right. What's happening here is you, let's say we've got water that's at a height of 100 feet or elevation might be a better word to use there. But let's say that's 100 feet. Okay. From there, what we can do, we can figure out the pressure down here. So that'd be 100 feet times what? 0.433. PSI per foot. So that's going to equal 43.3 PSI. 
And that's, see, that's going to be the pressure everywhere down here. All right. So what you got down in that pipe is you've got 43.3 PSI. And then if you allow for maybe a little bit of rounding difference here, if you take that 43.3 PSI and multiply it by 2.31 feet per PSI, what do you suppose you'll get? 100 feet, yeah. I mean, so what's happening there is you get pressure building up down at the bottom of that pipe, in the pipe. And then that pressure is the same everywhere in the pipe. So what the pressure does in those little piezometer tubes is pushes the water back up 100 feet. That, that's all that's going on. There, okay? but, but the idea is kind of uh, important when you're looking at, at water and how it acts. Because what you have up here is up here you have elevation. Okay. What do you suppose the pressure is right on the water surface, the gauge pressure? Zero, yeah, there isn't any. And now down here, you got no elevation, but that elevation gets turned into pressure. And then it just changes when you get over there. Just the pressure pushes the water back up. You get back in the same situation. So if you want to get a little bit fancy about how you're analyzing that, what's going on is you're taking elevation, changing it to pressure, and then changing it back to elevation. So there's a certain amount of energy in the water that you can convert into different forms. That's the idea, okay? So the elevation is converted to pressure in the pipe and the pressure pushes water up the piezometer. Okay. So we got one foot is 0.433 PSI and one PSI is 2.31 feet. All right. Now, if you want to look at this, you could think about, you know, how we might be getting this uh, energy to turn the lights on. Look at a hydroelectric electric dam. You know, we have a few of these around Oregon. It's actually a pretty big deal for the Northwest having, you know, the Rocky Mountains kind of pushing this water down the coast here, down to the coast, because we get lots of hydroelectric dams. And that gets this nice, uh, cheap energy. And what do you suppose some of the energy intensive industries are? I think aluminum smelting is one of them, okay? So now you, you can make aluminum here in the Northwest pretty cheap. What do you suppose follows from that up there in Seattle? Boeing. Boeing, yeah, Boeing follows that. Doesn't it? That's one of the biggest economic drivers of the whole area, isn't it? Okay, that's why they're there, because they get cheap aluminum originally to make their airplanes out of. Okay. All right, so, so let's kind of follow through how this works. Okay, let's say we got a little, you know, a river, um, you know, whatever river that might be, the Columbia or whatever, um, San Am. And let's say you've got a place in the river where you got some canyons and a place to put a reservoir. You can put a dam at the head of the canyons and build the water up and get a reservoir, okay? So what happens up here is you've got elevation for the water, okay? You can do that by building a dam. All right. Now, the next thing you can do is further down near the bottom of the dam, that elevation becomes pressure, right? Just like what we just did. Then you can put a hole in the dam and let the water flow through the hole. And you might want to, you know, be a little bit more specific about how you make the hole and all that, but that's a tunnel of some sort. So what's going to happen is that pressure is going to push water through the hole. So you're going to get velocity. Okay, now these things are called head, which means energy. I think that's an old term that comes from the steam engine days. Okay, so we get water behind the dam has elevation head at the top. The elevation head is converted to pressure head near the bottom of the dam. The pressure head pushes the water through the opening there. And we got a large pipe going through the dam. Okay, the velocity, and so then you get velocity head. The velocity head in the water turns a turbine that creates electricity and, and that's transmitted by wires to our lights and turns on the lights. That's how it works, okay? If they're all forms of energy. You just transfer from elevation to pressure to velocity to electricity. That, that's how that system works, okay? 
And you can use this idea to analyze water as it moves in pipe, in a, in a pipe, okay? Or in a system like, like what you got for a city. Quite often you wanna work off of elevation head if you can. Right. So this is on page 94. So, um, you know, that's a nice even way of creating a nice blanket of pressure over an area. It's a nice way to store water if you can, store it up high and give it elevation head. Okay. Now, elevation head can do something called work. Work is a form of energy. Work is a force that you can apply over a distance. In the case of elevation head, the force is the weight of the water, and the distance is the distance the water would drop. You can then convert elevation head to pressure head. It pressure head pushes with a force, and that's how it can create work. You can exert a force over a distance because pressure head creates force, as we were just going over there a couple chapters ago. And then you can use pressure to create velocity, which has energy in its motion, a kinetic energy as they call it. Okay, so these are the three common forms of energy that we use when we analyze water. Now the thing about this is as we just showed, you can uh, take one form and convert it to the other. So these three are interconvertible and you can use whatever your piping system is and whatever water system you've got going to change energy to these different forms and back and forth. You know, you can go elevation to pressure, back up to elevation if you want, okay? Now there's one other form of energy, which is a loss of energy, and it's called head loss or friction loss sometimes. All right, and what happens when you take water and you push it through a pipe or you push it through foot uh, fittings, you get uh, friction, and that turns into heat, and the heat just dissipates off into the atmosphere and it's gone. So once something is head loss, you've lost it. So it's a little different than the other forms in that once something turns into head loss, it's gone, you can't get it back. The other three forms you can convert into each other, but head loss, you can't, all right? So this is a useful way to analyze uh, water systems, okay? So it's handy to have one unit that you work with to work with all these different things. So we have to do a little bit of unit conversions here. This is on page 96. So elevation is in feet. Now that's the common unit that you use to measure energy in water. It's measured as a height above a datum. A datum is a reference plane that you measure up from. Um, the common one that surveyors use is sea level. Okay. So it's just some height above some reference line that you've created. Now pressure is in PSI, of course, but we've already shown that if you take pressure times 2.31, you can convert it into feet. We'd like to get all these different forms of energy into the same unit so we can add them up and see how much total energy we've got. So the unit that's chosen is feet. Okay. So PSI, you can convert to feet pretty easily. Just multiply it by 2.31. Now velocity is in feet per second. But what you can do with that, and you need calculus to derive this and some physics is take the velocity squared over twice the acceleration due to gravity, which is 32.2. So if you take the velocity squared and divide it by 64.4, you'll get energy in feet. Okay. And I think you just have to take that one on faith. I don't know if we'll derive that or anything. And the last one, there's head loss, which is in feet. It's measured in feet. So if you get all these forms of energy into one unit, that being feet, you can start to uh, analyze systems. That's the idea. Okay. So we okay with that? We got any questions on that bit?
So let's say we've got a pipe up there and it's uh, got some known conditions at point A. So at point A, we've got, we, the surveyors have been up there, so we know that it's a 200 feet above sea level. We've got a pressure gauge in there, and we know the pressure gauge reads um, 100 PSI. And we also know the velocity at point A is 8.025 feet per second. Okay. Let's figure out how much total energy we've got there. Well, what do we got? Elevation head's pretty easy because it's just written right on there. So we got 200 feet of elevation head. That's how high above sea level we're at. Now the pressure head is 100 PSI, and we know that there's 2.31 feet for every PSI. So that comes out to be, what, 231 feet. And the last one's probably the most complicated one. What you do on that is you take the eight 0.025 feet per second, that's the velocity. You square it and you divide it by 2 times 32.2 and the units on acceleration due to gravity are feet per second squared. Okay. So what you're going to do then, you're going to take 8.025 squared, and that's 64.4, and that'll work out to be feet squared per second squared, divided by 64.4 feet per second squared. So that'll get us feet, which is what we want, and all that is is one foot, okay? So you just take whatever the velocity is in feet per second, you square it, and you divide it by 64.4. That's about what you do there to get the uh, velocity head, as it's called. Um, let's see. I don't know if anybody works around water distribution much, but 8 feet per second. What, how is that in a water distribution system? Is that high, low? Average, what is the average velocity? What's that? Yeah, it does depend. Upsize. Okay, I, from my experience, that's really high. Okay, it's, you don't want your velocities that high because it can really tear up your system. Yeah, if that, yeah. It depends, yeah, and like you say, it depends. If you're fighting a fire and the water's really moving, if you're just using residential, regular residential usage, it's not. but. I really wouldn't want water in my water distribution system to go on eight feet per second. That's, that's a little much, okay? But no, so for a very high velocity, you just get a foot of energy. So velocity head doesn't create, it usually isn't that big. So often it's just ignored, okay? Let's keep that in mind. It's just not significant enough to really bother with because it's a lot of work to calculate it. You know, if you want, you could always throw it in there, but Often they don't bother because it just doesn't usually amount to much. If average velocity is being like four feet per second, that would get you 0.25 feet of velocity head, which is less than a psi, and it's not it's not a big deal. Okay, so so often we ignore that. So if, to get the total energy, then why don't we just add everything up? Okay, we'll just run it down, add it up, and we get 432 feet. Okay, so that's what we get there for the, okay. So that's, um, <clears throat> that's how much it would go up if it was to go down the two Theoretically, right. If, if, if we had a pipe and we took this pipe and we bent it back up, theoretically, for the conditions we've got at A, we could take that flow 
run it up here to call it point C, and point C would be 432 feet above datum, and the water would stop right there. Now, it's not literally true, but theoretically, that's the idea. We're taking all the energy we've got and we're converting it into just elevation. We'll see how high it'll go. Yeah, of course. You can put, um, well, let's see. So the question is why are we measuring the, that, that uh, elevation at 200 when the bend is down at 120? Wouldn't it make perhaps more sense to measure the elevation from the lowest point in the system? Right. And let's see. Normally, what we're looking at are elevation differences when we're doing this stuff. So if we say the elevation at A is 200 and the elevation at B is 120, which is really what we'd be looking at to really determine flow is the, the, um, you know, the difference. That's the same difference as if you call this 80 and this 0. They, they represent the same thing. So it's going to come out in the wash. What you need to do is have one datum and stick with it through the whole analysis. You can't be jumping around with different data. So typically what you use is elevation above sea level because on your, on your plans you're going to have that. So rather than kind of using different datums for different problems at the low point of your system, typically what you do, you just use sea level for everything. And you'll get the differences that you need. Okay. Um, so that's kind of hard to see, but here's a, a what's called a hydraulic grade line for a, this is a storm drain system, I think. Um, and you can't, I, I know that's hard for you to see. It's not in your book. It's just a thing I pulled out of a journal. Um, but what you've got there, if you look at it, are elevations above sea level because that's what they, that's how they mapped it. So it's from 225 down to one. 62. Okay. So that's commonly what you've got, all right? All right, so this idea of energy and water is, is used to analyze things. And it's just kind of an important thing to, to understand. What, one thing we use it for is hydraulic grade line. A hydraulic grade line is a line that joins the points together of the elevations that the water would rise to if it were allowed to rise as high as it wanted to. So for a hydraulic grade line, you just think of starting wherever your water surface is and connecting that to points if, as if you put a piezometer in the pipe at different points and saw how high the water would rise. Okay. So if you have, you know, a closed valve, a, a hydraulic grade line would just be flat because there's no change. What happens if you open the valve up and you start having flow coming out? Well, it's going to start dropping, yeah. What, what, what's, what's happening there? What do you get in the pipe if, if you open that valve up? Yeah, you, you're, you're relieving pressure. What you got in here is head loss, see? Because the water's starting to flow. That'll cause a slight drop in pressure. And then what'll happen there is when you have head loss, you lose energy. So if you drew a horizontal line here, the drop would be the head loss. That's energy you've lost, okay? So if you take these points and connect them together, what you get is something called a hydraulic grade line. And this can be a handy tool to analyze your system with, okay? And here's a hydraulic grade line uh, from 2010. And what they were doing with this is they were looking at, it's either, I think it's a storm drain is what this is. OK, 
Okay, now what's happening with this system is when it really starts to rain, it fills up the manholes and it actually super, kind of supercharges and pressurizes the whole system. And you gotta be very careful with that. Let's see if I can find what I'm looking for here. Yeah, here's a movie taken at night of a heavy rainstorm. You can see all that water coming down. See how that water's starting to pop out of that manhole there? That's what can happen if you've got too much rain going through those systems. <laughs> now, this is a pretty extreme example. It was extreme enough to make YouTube. But if you're not careful, if you've got that system running up a hill and that fills up, that'll just push the water up, right up out of the manhole. And, you know, in this case, it just obviously just shot the lid right off the manhole, and then here we go, and there's the lid, huh? <laughs> yeah, it did. Yeah, too bad, huh? So, uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that that's something. Now, this is really an extreme example. You know, don't. Yeah. So this one obviously uh, was kind of bad. Um but this is something that can occur, that can occur, all right? And what what you could do is analyze that with a hydraulic grade line and maybe see that you're in for some trouble on this before it happens. Here it comes. Oh boy, look at that. Whoa. Kind of like old faithful there, huh? Yeah, who knows, man? They're common in the Northwest. I mean, yeah. Yeah, so uh, there you go. I mean, who saw that coming, huh? Okay, so that's that's what, uh, you know, what we'd like to avoid if we could. Um, hmm. We got another one here? No. I haven't looked at this one before. Oh, this is an explosion. Oh, really? Do we want to watch this? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I saw. I had an old slide of this, and it was in Mexico where they had some propane or something getting a sewer. The whole street was just blown up. I mean, it just went right down the sewer and ignited, and that was really something. I don't, I don't think it was sewer gas. I think something actually leaked in there. Sure. Um, Oh, uh, maybe they want to flush it in some way. I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Now, you all know that sewers are confined spaces, right? You know, if they're running down manholes, you all know that. It's a really important thing. When I, you know, I used to survey years ago, and I've been down in a couple of them. That was well, well before those um, regulations. So they sent me down a 20 foot manhole to shoot the bottom of it. You know. That's, uh, yeah, this is zero hand. Down you go.
All right, I guess we got the idea here. There's smoke coming out of the manhole, so. Uh, there we go. So you can, now, if you use these hydraulic grade lines properly, and if you have a good idea what the weather is going, you know what the worst case weather scenario might be, you could figure out what's going to happen because. What happens is if the hydraulic grade line ends up going over the top of the manhole, right there, see the hydraulic grade line is on the top. The manhole is actually underneath the hydraulic grade line. So what that means that with the top of the manhole being underneath the hydraulic grade line is the water, the pressure down here, if this gets what's called surcharged, where this, this side gets full, the pressure in the manhole could be enough to push the water right out of the manhole, like you just saw. Okay. So, so that's the use of these things. Okay. So what you would do to, to draw one of these is you'd figure out uh, the, the starting elevation of your system and the pressure that would build up in the system as you're working your way down the line and then the velocity, and then just add the three together as feet and get an elevation. Okay. So there's an example there of a hydraulic grade line. Um, why don't we just look at this here for a minute. That's on page 98. Now notice what happens to the grade line as it crosses a gully there or a, you know, a valley. What's going to happen here? Now, notice the pipe is dropping quite a bit. Why doesn't the grade line drop the same amount? What's happening? I mean, yeah, right, the pressure's building up is what's happening. I'm losing this. So what happens there is the pressure builds up. And when the pressure builds up, the, um, it pushes the grade line higher. So even though you're going down and across a valley, the pressure goes up and that pushes the grade line up. So if you cross a valley, your hydraulic grade line isn't necessarily gonna drop that much. Okay. All right, so why don't we figure out, why don't we get a hydraulic grade line going for this pipeline here? So what we have here are the elevations and the pressures. Um, we're going to ignore velocity head. That's commonly done because it usually doesn't amount to a whole lot. So if the pressure is 20 PSI, Let's find the pressure head. What, 2.31 feet per PSI? So what that what's that gonna be? Is that gonna be 46.2 feet? Yes. All right, and then we'll take that and we'll add it here. And we'll get up to 196.2 feet total. All right. And you can see what's going on with this pipeline, too. As we're running down the pipeline, the pressure goes up. Oh, I did. Do I have velocity on yours or no? Uh, no. Well, it's yeah. in there, in but there. You don't, you're not asking. Yeah, I said ignore it. So we'll just it. ignore it. Okay. So why don't you calculate up those uh, elevations there as you're working your way through that uh, grade line. What's the first one? We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. No, my girlfriend's brother-in-law is an engineer and he's doing a hydraulic lab right now in Portland City Hall. Yeah, so he keeps asking, have you learned it yet? Have you learned it yet? Well, it's just so much. It's probably in here. 
So just take those pressures, convert it to elevations, then add them to the elevation of the pipe. I've got kind of a little sheet to do this on on page 99. Once you got those points, you just connect the dots.
Okay, so 150 and 46.2 gets you 196.2. 110 and 69.2 gets you 179.3. And then uh, 60 for elevation, and then the 48 PSI gets you um, 110.9. And so add the 60 and the 110.9, and you get 170.9. Yeah, I guess we're not responding here. Will you let me shut it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. I'm I'm trying to rush it too much. I think it doesn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, someday all this stuff will work. Maybe. And of course, I just lost everything I've done there. But um, there we go. And I've got it actually plotted up there. I think on page one hundred. So this will get you the total of adding everything up. So that's 196.2 and 179.3 and 170.9 and one uh, whatever 163.1. Okay, so which way is the water flowing, to the right or the left? Yeah, I can tell it's flowing to the right because as that hydraulic grade line moves to the right, it drops. Okay? So that's what's going to happen. You, you've got head loss, so the, the water just drops as you work your way across. Um, yeah, it could be. Depends on what, you know, how deep the pipeline's buried. But, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, it could. I don't know if I want to be burying a pipeline 60 feet. <laughs> I take a pretty long arm on the back row. <laughs> All right, so that's a hydraulic grade line. That's the idea. Are we okay with that? Questions? All right. All right, and then as I was saying, this uh, King County that's up in near Seattle there, um, you know, they've got a sewer line that runs through some ground. They used a GIS, geographic information system, kind of takes a map and you, you can overlay a database on it and work with this stuff. So they've got the elevations of their manholes and then they plot that up and then they plot their hydraulic grade line and what they're looking for are places where that grade line comes up near the top of the manhole because they've got some problems then because if that grade line goes above the manhole the water could just flow on out like what we just observed maybe not quite that dramatically but that would be the idea 
Okay. Um, I don't know. Um, let's let's see. I think I just have the URL here somewhere. There it is. One forty four. Sewer back up, sewer backup, flying manhole covers. <laughs> sewer, oh, okay, sewer drain explosion. There it is. Okay. <laughs> okay, good idea. Okay, all right, now let's look at uh, one other thing here. Um, let's have a look at what I would call um, energy analysis, but it was figured out by this really smart fellow back in the Renaissance from Italy called Bernoulli. I think it was Jacob Bernoulli. There was this whole family of Bernoullis and they were all a bunch of smart people. So this is on probably about page 102 or thereabouts. Uh, not quite. Okay, so 103. Oh, let's see. So this is something called Bernoulli's equation. I'm sorry, this is 101. Here we go, 101. And what this fella figured out was that if you take all the energy in water at some point that you can find it for, subtract off the head losses from that point to another, that'll equal the energy left over at point B. So let's say we're at A, then we look at the head loss as we go from A to B. That will equal the energy at B. Okay, that, that's what he figured out. And he also was able to figure out what the forms of energy were in water. And that's the bit I've never quite figured out, how someone 500 years ago could get this figured out, but he did. Okay, and so he knows, knew that the forms of energy in water were elevation, pressure head, and velocity head. So what this turns into is elevation A plus pressure head A plus velocity head A minus the head loss from A to B is elevation B plus pressure head B plus velocity head B. So that's what he was able to determine. And what this does is it allows you to analyze a system of water that, that you have and allows you to really figure out what the pressures will be at, in certain places, what the uh, velocities might be, et cetera, elevations, et cetera, et cetera. So, what we have you do 9 1 through 9 5. What should we do with this? Do. I'll make it do um, not this Wednesday, but next after the test, okay, 18, 25. So that'll be the 25th. They're, they're, those are velocity problems, okay. We're about out of time here, so we'll just leave it there. We'll get into this more on Wednesday. I'll get you a review for that test coming up also, so you have some idea what to expect. Okay, so we'll call it good.